Hey everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History. Let's talk about no-fly zones within the context of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Seems to be a very popular topic out there. Lots of opinions and it's of course set within a developing situation. So full disclosure, I am taping this on the 6th of March at 6 p.m. Zulu time. Now this topic, I think it could use a little bit of a sober and nuanced and grounded analysis because basically, Full disclosure, I focus on military aviation, but when it comes to the legal matters, as well as the policy implications of no-fly zones, as well as the requirements for them, that was also relatively new to me. And I think it is actually relatively new to all of us, although everybody's seemingly talking about it right now. So based on what is happening, I wanted to know for myself, what does a no-fly zone actually mean within the context of the Russian-Ukrainian war beyond the noise that I hear about it in the media? And sources as in all my videos are also set in the description below. I quickly ran into a couple of things that actually surprised me, might surprise you as well, made me think about the applicability of no-fly zones in general and what they mean. So let's talk about that. So the first thing I'm going to do is to talk about no-fly zones in general and what they mean beyond the implication that you know the word carries. It might seem simple, it's not. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take that discussion and then apply it to Ukraine and the conflict that is happening there and talk about what a no-fly zone actually means in practical terms for Western countries and or NATO. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show that the situation is extremely complex, not just because of you know, the practical reality, but also for things such as rules, rules of engagement or the escalation chain that can happen from there. And I think by the end of the video, we'll have gone through a lot of information that will help you understand no-fly zones a little bit better, as well as that you will have information that perhaps you have not gotten through the media, and that will allow you to make up your mind yourself whether a no-fly zone right now over Ukraine is the best policy option that Western countries and NATO have, or whether or not other options should be preferred. So, Let's get started. Although the answer might seem obvious, we should ask the question, what actually is a no-fly zone? Descriptions of air exclusion zones, or NFZs, no-fly zones, are relatively consistent. Timothy McIlmel describes the purpose of no-fly zones as prohibiting the entry of unauthorized aircraft into airspace over specified territory. Michael Schmidt defines no-fly zones as a de facto aerial occupation of sovereign airspace in which, absent consent of the entity authorizing the occupation, only aircraft of the enforcement forces may fly. The essence of a no-fly zone in United Nations Security Council practice, consequently, is that it is declared over sovereign airspace, i.e. the airspace above all or part of the landmass and territorial sea of the state of concern, purports to exclude certain classes of aircraft from that airspace and is enforceable by United Nations Security Council authorized or sanctioned forces from both within and outside that airspace. This shows that a no-fly zone is not just a political statement or some sort of half measure by which support can be given. No, a no-fly zone is a military operation that does not just imply the possibility of combat, but actively requires it. To establish a no-fly zone, one must first gain and maintain air supremacy, not merely air superiority. Air supremacy means not only control of the air, but also the elimination of threats of air operations from the ground. The problem is that in the West, we have associated no-fly zones with operations in Iraq, in Kosovo, as well as in Libya. And there, I mean, the operations took part against adversaries that had relatively limited air and air defense capabilities. Although these operations were, of course, not risk-free. But there weren't necessarily no fly zones in the traditional sense either, because not only was it about keeping wings on the ground, but it was also about going after the air defenses that were in the region. As well as that, sometimes other targets were struck as well, like, for example, artillery positions in Libya. And the relative ease, or at least in the public eye, that with which these operations were carried out has given perhaps a wrong impression about the cost, the risk, as well as the political and military implications that these operations, these no-fly zones, actually carry. They were carried out against adversaries that had very little chance 
against a coordinated campaign based on Western air power. And that is not the case now. Make no mistake, a no-fly zone imposed by NATO or any Western country would mean war with Russia. And Russia is a nuclear power that has ever-diminishing options on the table for themselves and their operations in Ukraine, at least from the perspective that we have. Let's swing over then to the conflict in Ukraine. My last video highlighted the seemingly poor performance of the Russian Air Force, well, aerospace forces to be exact and explained a few of the potential reasons for this and I also had invited a couple of experts who carried on that train of thought and even lined out that perhaps the Russian Air Force is incapable of launching and sustaining an operation uh, that would be required for the, the invasion of Ukraine. Whether that is the case or not, the West should not necessarily be overconfident over the apparent, well, the apparent Russian failures in the air domain. The Russians do have a lot of planes in the area, including very modern uh, air superiority fighters like the Sukhoi-33s and Sukhoi-35 fighters that are potent machines. And as well as that, their ground-based radar stations, as well as their air defense batteries of, for example, S-300 and S-400 long-range surface-to-air missiles, do make for a very potent package. And these air defense platforms also are considered to be among the best in the world. Considering this, let us, as a thought exercise, entertain this idea that a no-fly zone is a realistic policy option. It is not, but that allows me at least to explain what it actually means in practical terms. For this we have to essentially look at a map first. The Russians have an advantage in terms of basing. Some of their bases are around 200 nautical miles from Kiev. The nearest NATO bases are in Romania, around 350 nautical miles uh, from Kiev. Those in Poland are at least 430 nautical miles distance. Those in Slovakia are at a distance of 450 nautical miles. Even if additional airports in these countries are made available, which would be likely, this takes time. Not all are equipped or built to actually handle military operations. And then using airfields in Ukraine would make Western aircraft vulnerable to ballistic and cruise missiles. That is of course one part of the escalation chain that might happen from a no-fly zone. The next problem then are Russian and potentially Belarusian air defenses, especially long-range SAM sites for medium and high altitude. These create protective bubbles around Russian assets and make certain areas very difficult to navigate for Western aircraft, increasing travel distances, decreasing loiter times and making certain areas off limits. There would have to be a massive investment, for example, also in electronic warfare in order to make these areas viable for Western aircraft. Western Air Forces would also have to use tankers, a complex task they are capable of fulfilling, but in themselves tankers are vulnerable as well and thus will have to operate at long distances too. This is even made more difficult due to Russian long-range early warning radar sites, which have a multi-aspect perspective into the airspace over Ukraine. To have a similar picture in the area, Western Air Forces would also most likely have to rely on vulnerable assets like AWACS. Although Russian radar is less effective against planes at very low altitudes, it does provide Russian forces with credible early warning and constant updates on the location of Western fighter jets, as well as enablers like tankers and AWACS. Then Russia is said to have around 300 aircraft in striking distance of Ukraine. This includes older models like Sukhoi-25 aircraft, but also modern air superiority fighters like the Sukhoi-35 and it seems they also deployed Sukhoi-33 fighters because those guys are essentially out of a job right now since the Russian aircraft carrier Kuznetsov is currently undergoing repairs. Which by the way is lucky for Western countries because if Kuznetsov was running its presence in the Atlantic or Mediterranean right now would complicate matters even more. This means that Western countries would have to employ a large quantity of aircraft and constant patrolling in high numbers to be able to react in time. This makes for a very crowded airspace with the potential of dangerous mistakes. Likewise, this does not include the issue of Russian helicopters, which also have to be considered, as well as the situation concerning Russian Kaliningrad enclave. Let us consider all of that for just one moment. A no-fly zone is not just a ticket for war with Russia, and Western countries or the whole of NATO, 
and to further escalation down that path, but the no-fly zone in itself is incredibly impractical and requires such a vast amount of resources from Western countries to make it happen without actually guaranteeing any success. Russian planes could still strike targets in an environment where they are covered mainly by their own air defense bubble. Uh, they could fo quickly fold their aircraft back into said bubble if they go beyond it. And yeah, behind the screen, the Russian pilots can just wait and sit back and have their air defenses take pot shots at Western aircraft that loiter into these areas. To be immune from those threats, NATO forces or Western forces would have to operate from standoff distances that are extremely long. And although we have some evidence to suggest now, based on the operations that we're seeing in Ukraine, that you know, Russian air and air defense forces do not really have the required coordination that we've thought they might have had, and also not the quality that the West had initially inspected it to have, that does not mean that they wouldn't be able to do this. And likewise, it must be considered that at the same time as Western aircraft are potentially operating above Ukrainian airspace, Ukrainian air defenses could also pose a threat to Western aircraft through accidents, miscommunication and miscoordination, which could especially be a real issue in the first couple of days when a no-fly zone is being called in. By the way, I'm very interested to hear all of your opinions on this question as well. Do you think that a no-fly zone is a viable solution for what's happening over in Ukraine? Do you think that other policy options would be a better course of action? What are your opinions? What are your feedback? What are your additions to what I'm saying here? Put them in the comment section below. And of course, if you do find this content interesting and if you want to support more of it, do consider doing so via Patreon or channel memberships. But now let's talk again about the situation that we have right now. Considering what I've said before, we do have to recognize that if a no-fly zone is called in place, Russia actually holds a significant advantage in many, many ways. NATO would not have to destroy, first engage and then destroy Russian air assets that violate, violate this no-fly zone, but it is doing so at a severe disadvantage due to the proximity of Russian air bases, the air defense screen, as well as that the uh, early warning that Russian forces will most likely get from their radar sites. So to enforce the no-fly zone, Western aircraft would have to operate, first penetrate and then operate within the Russian protective screen of missiles and aircraft. And at the same time, they would also have to keep overwatch over enablers like, for example, tankers and AWACS, as well as that in, develop a whole new logistical chain for, for both the support and the supply of the air asset it deploys in the region, as well as build up potentially new basing options in the region as well, which is coming with such a great cost as well that is associated to it is, and cannot just be done like so. And likewise, a no-fly zone over Ukraine, this we have to recognize as well, does not extend over Russian airspace. And two aspects are really important here for the further discussion of what it actually means to build up a no-fly zone. Consider a combat aircraft flying at high speed and altitude towards a no-fly zone line. Armed with long-range air-to-air missiles, this high fast flyer is a potent threat to enforcement aircraft, particularly non-fighters such as tankers. The longer enforcement aircraft wait to engage us, the greater the threat it poses and the more difficult it will be to counter if it crosses the line. Yet it has done nothing to suggest hostile intent. It has threatened no one. Instead, the high fast flyer has merely flown within its own sovereign space as it is clearly entitled to do under international law. Unless it commits an act that in some way reveals malevolent intent, it may not be engaged until it has crossed that line. Of course, this question might be mute if the conflict between Russia and Western countries due to no-fly zones escalates, but it is worthwhile to consider. And this also poses some very clear other questions about what targets are actually targets and under what conditions. There are a number of gray areas that would need to be addressed in the rules of engagement, whether formal or informal. Will suppression of enemy air defenses, seed, strikes be limited to specific SAM or anti-aircraft artillery, AAA sites, that fired at the patrolling aircraft, or does such an attack make other elements of an integrated air defense system, IATS, 
such as command and control facilities or other SAM and AAA sites liable to retaliatory attack. Will tracking an aircraft with a fire control radar be treated as a hostile act calling for retaliatory siege even if no shots are fired by the associated SAM or AAA system? Will all attacks directed against aircraft imposing the no-fly zone be triggers for response or will trivial ones such as light AAA shooting at aircraft that are outside of range be ignored? Will strikes only be launched in immediate response to attacks or will weapons or systems that fired at no-fly zone aircraft be considered fair game for counterattacks days or weeks after the initial provocation? While these questions are perhaps not considered in the public discussion, they must be considered by planners and policymakers, showing that you know, this quite simple solution of making a no-fly zone is in fact incredibly complex, beyond the fact that of course Western countries would be engaging a nuclear power, as well as that the escalation that will certainly happen from essentially day one of uh, the enforcement of this uh, no-fly zone, which Fair enough, could make some of these questions mute points, but maybe not. And in order to take away Russia's advantage here and allow the enforcement of a no-fly zone, Western air power would have to strike not just at targets that violate the no-fly zone, but it would have to strike at Russian assets in Russian territory itself, which would be a mon mon monumental task. It's so monumental I couldn't even say the, say the word correctly. And as well as that, there is that escalation chain that I said once again. So to sum this up, in order to actually make a no-fly zone over Ukraine, you have to go beyond what you would have to do to maintain a no-fly zone. And that is why a no-fly zone over Ukraine is not as simple as it sounds. I hope that you got something from this video, that it proved valuable in some ways, that the information contained in it uh, is useful. If it is, let me know in the comments below. If you want to add anything there, do that as well. Of course, my description, the sources are linked there as well. You can have a look and see where the information comes from and do some further reading yourself as well. And as always, if you do enjoy this content, consider supporting over Patreon or ch via channel memberships. And as always, even though the times are rough at the moment, I do wish that all of you have a great day.